What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to say before the start of the video, if you like these daily uploads and you like these longer Mega Mix compilations, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you end up enjoying the video. These longer videos take much longer to make than the normal daily ones, by several hours. So any support you show by doing all of that will help these videos do well and make sure I can make more of them in the future. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as my favorite part of doing these videos is reading your guys' thoughts on the stories in them. With that all said, thank you guys so much for watching, I'll see you at the end of the video, and I hope you guys enjoy the next two hours of True Scary Stories. This is a very scary experience I had back when I was a kid. I was nine years old, and this happened back in 1999. I'm an only child, and I live with my mom and my dad. I was also homeschooled growing up. My mom would teach me various things. She also worked as a piano instructor out of our house. On this day in particular, though... It was just she and I at home. She was teaching me some subject that I can't quite remember. We were at the table in the living room. It was probably some time in the morning, when out of nowhere, we heard the sound of glass breaking. It sounded like one of the bedroom windows was being smashed in. The room was a ways away, but we both knew that somebody was likely breaking in. I remember my mom grabbing me and taking me to the end of the living room. We ran into the office there. It was a little office space that my parents sometimes used. It had a desk and various bookshelves. We closed the door and locked it. Then my mom dialed 911. We could hear somebody walking around the house and soon enough they entered the living room. My mom spoke with the police briefly. I remember her telling them there was an intruder. I was really scared, and I had no clue what was going on. I kept asking my mom what was happening, and she just kept saying I should be quiet and try to stay calm. We ducked underneath the desk in the office and hid. We could hear the footsteps walking throughout the house. They got closer and closer to us, and soon enough they were right outside the office door. That's when things got real. We were both as silent as we could be. The person tried to open the door, which obviously was locked. They tried several more times, and then knocked on it. We stayed where we were, and didn't move a single muscle. My mom called out to the man. She yelled that the police were already on their way. At first, there was no response. Soon enough, though, there was a sound of a deep laugh echoing from the other side. It was one of the creepiest laughs I'd ever heard. I was so confused. I didn't know why the man would laugh at this. He started walking away, and we could hear his footsteps moving around the house further. We were glad he was moving away from our location, at least. We didn't know what he was doing, though. Was he going through the rest of the house to steal stuff? Or was he going to find some object he could use to try and break the door down? We had no way to know. After he walked away, we heard what sounded like the back door opening. Maybe he was actually leaving. Things got really quiet after that, but we didn't dare to leave the office. We didn't even move out from underneath the desk. Not until five or so minutes later, when the police finally arrived. Only when the police were knocking at the door did we finally get up and let them in. They searched the house and the entire property, but unfortunately the man was never found. He had smashed open the window to my bedroom. It was really scary. Nothing in the entire house had been stolen. After that, my dad came home from work early, and we all talked to the police officers for a while. My window was replaced the next day. The only good part is that the person never came back. However, we never got a good look at who he was, and we don't know what he did that for either.
Not that long ago, I was out there in the world trying my hand at the online dating thing. I never struggled in that department, which I guess is a good thing. I always liked the idea of connecting with someone on the internet. At the time, I was only meeting girls either at work or at the bar, and I wanted to branch out and see if I could meet someone a bit different. I can't remember if it was on Tinder or a different one of those dating apps, but the girl I met was named Scarlet. I thought her name was really cool, and she was beautiful as well. With all the catfishing and fake profiles I'd heard about out there, I was convinced that Scarlet had to be fake. I proceeded very carefully and made some small talk for a while. Eventually, I was able to establish this was in fact a real person, so I set up a date for us to meet. I wanted to go right for dinner and some drinks because that's what I knew best, but she had some other ideas. Since I was trying to branch out of my comfort zone, I was open to just about everything. She asked if I was familiar with this forest that was near my hometown. The forest is huge and has a trail that actually extends throughout three states. At least, I think it's three states. I agreed to have the first date at the park. I got myself a fresh haircut and planned out a picnic for us at this park in the forest. Since summer was now over and this was in the middle of the week, we didn't plan on seeing many other people out there. When the day arrived, I picked her up downtown outside of the building she said she lived in, and we made the 45-minute drive out to the forest. Just as we thought, when we pulled into the lot, there was only one other car there. I was excited to have the entire place to ourselves. Not that having people around would have made much a difference, since this place was so huge anyway. Out to the side of the parking lot was this beautiful overview of a scenic area. I held her hand as we walked towards this view. And that's when I surprised her with the picnic I had set up. She was excited and seemed really happy. It was nothing too extravagant, just some sandwiches and various other things. We ate and sat down on the blanket that I'd brought and just talked for a while. It was nice to have a date that wasn't at a bar or a restaurant or somewhere loud. When we finally finished and packed everything up, I asked if she wanted to explore some of the trails with me. She smiled and looked all around us, then said, Actually, I have a better idea, but promise you won't judge me, okay? I was intrigued and played along with her. She looked down and in a shy and almost tentative voice, she whispered, why don't we play hide and seek? It was a weird suggestion to be sure. I was not expecting that. She hit my arm in a playful way and said, Come on, it'll be fun. Just you and I out here in the woods hiding. As I write this out, I realize how weird this sounds. But in the moment, with the way she was talking, it seemed like a fun and playful idea. I can honestly say I wasn't really thinking with my head if that makes sense. I agreed to play, and she got really excited. She told me to hide first, and she would count to 30. I didn't want to run too deep into the woods, because I had no idea where I was going. We had been sitting about 40 feet away from one of the trails, so I decided to hide behind a tree on the right side of the trailhead. Not exactly a very good spot, but I thought we were just doing a cute game of hide and seek, I didn't try to be the master of disguise or anything. I heard her count out to 30, and she started making her way towards me. She saw me right away, and started yelling at me in a playful way. She begged me to take it seriously, and hide somewhere good. She could see I was skeptical. She decided to implement a rule that if she couldn't find me in 20 minutes, we would head back to the trailhead and meet up. I was reluctant, but eventually I agreed. I ran out into the woods and tried to find a spot to hide. This might sound a bit strange, but there weren't a ton of spots to hide actually, unless you went off the path, which I didn't want to do. I was jogging deeper into the woods and found some thicker trees I thought could serve as some decent cover. I positioned myself behind them and started the timer on my phone. 
While I was leaning against the tree, I felt something cold touch the back of my neck. I didn't have a chance to react before I heard a low voice whisper in my ear. Empty your pockets. Slowly put your wallet, keys, and phone on the ground in front of you. Don't look back, and don't try anything heroic unless you want me to use this cold steel. I did what he said, and I could feel him reach in front of me and grab my stuff. I had my eyes closed. Whatever he had on my neck, he pushed in even harder. He said, Now I want you to count to a thousand before you move again. If you don't, your night is going to get a lot worse. I could hear him stepping away. I didn't care, though. I still counted all the way to a thousand out of complete fear. When I hit a thousand seconds, I turned around and sprinted out of the forest. I couldn't find Scarlet anywhere. I started to fear the worst. Even though he'd stolen my keys, he didn't steal my car, which I thought was a victory. I couldn't drive it without the key, though. I remembered not far from the parking lot was a gas station. I decided to run there and have them call the police. I gave the cops all the information, and I told them I feared something may have happened to Scarlet. After that investigation, though, it was like she'd disappeared from the face of the earth. Her dating profile had been deleted, and nobody reported seeing her. The police thought she may have been involved with the person who robbed me, since nobody with the name of Scarlet was ever reported missing. You hardly ever think something like this can happen to you. I hope she's okay, but knowing that she's probably involved, I also hope she never gets the opportunity to hurt anyone else again. This story is a little hard for me to write. At the time, when I was just a child, I didn't notice anything strange. It's almost like when you're a kid, you think your family is indestructible and could do no harm. My brother and I found out real quick that life isn't always smiles and sunshine. At least 20 years ago, if not more, my brother and I stayed overnight at our grandparents' house. This may seem like a drag for some people, but we loved it. Grandma always had nice snacks and would rent us whatever movie we wanted to watch. Grandpa always played games with us and found ways to make them even more unique. He had a wild imagination, and it was just fun to be around them. At the time, Grandpa's health was declining, even though we didn't realize that yet. Thinking about it now, it's quite obvious that Grandpa was missing some steps compared to when we usually stayed over. But when you're a kid, you're just blind to all of that stuff. I remember I suggested that we play some hide-and-seek. That was one of my favorite games to play with him. He always had the best hiding spots and would somehow find new places to hide every time we played. My brother was excited, and we both begged Grandpa to play with us. He was a little dismissive at first, but eventually he was all smiles and agreed to play a game. We played a few rounds, and it was full of contagious laughter. When it was Grandpa's turn to hide, we were pumped up. We knew it was going to be a challenge, and it always felt like such an accomplishment when we finally found him. My brother and I would have our own little competition as to who could find him first. I decided to go upstairs, while my brother went downstairs. I was in the guest room where we would sleep, and I noticed the closet door was slightly ajar. I remembered it being closed before. I snuck over to the door and peeked in through the crack. I could see my grandpa there, just staring at the wall. I opened the door and shouted that I'd found him, but he didn't react at all. He just stood there like a statue, facing the wall. I moved a little closer and gripped the back of his flannel shirt. As I was saying his name, he whipped around, his face full of anger and malice. He screamed at me to get away from him. It almost didn't even sound like him. It scared me half to death. I was so scared I ran down into the kitchen and started to cry to Grandma. 
I'm sure she knew what was going on, but she consoled me anyway. Not two seconds later, Grandpa came downstairs all cheery and full of smiles. I guess you guys couldn't find me. It looks like I win this round. My grandma went over to him, and I heard her whisper that it was time to take a break, and he needed to sit down in his recliner for a while. He looked genuinely confused. I remembered feeling bad for him, until I remembered his face in that closet. I was terrified all night long. I remember grandma telling him I didn't feel good, and I was going to stay in our room for the night. My brother had no idea what happened. I told him that Grandpa snapped at me later that night, but he didn't believe me. He didn't think that Grandpa was capable of being that mean. In the middle of the night, my brother suddenly woke me up, looking absolutely terrified. I immediately came out of my groggy state and asked him what was wrong. He told me he could hear a voice coming out of the closet, the same closet Grandpa had been hiding in earlier. I started to listen in, since the closet was not that far from the bed. He was right. There were voices coming from inside. One sounded happy. Another sounded sad. You could even hear light sobbing. I didn't know what to do. I snuck over to the closet door while my brother gripped onto my shirt. I peeked in through the gap in the closet door. I remember the sight vividly. It was not multiple people making these voices. It was my grandpa making all of them. He was laughing, crying, switching back and forth erratically. We snuck by the door and ran to the living room, which was on the first floor of the house. We grabbed some blankets and hid underneath them. My grandma woke up early and saw us downstairs. We just told her we'd woke up early and were sitting downstairs to greet her. We didn't want to tell her about Grandpa. We were scared. We didn't know what was going on. The voices that he was making in that closet were the most horrifying thing I'd ever heard. Grandma made me breakfast. While Grandpa sat in the recliner and watched sports highlights, he looked completely normal. We just sat in the other room. After we ate and waited for our mother to pick us up, when she arrived, we ran to the car. We saw Grandma whispering to her on the front porch, and we noticed our mom's expression frown a lot. We got back in the car, and she asked us how everything went. We told her everything, how Grandpa had snapped at me, the scary behavior in the closet, the erratic crying and laughing in the middle of the night. I don't remember what she said exactly. She tried to explain to us that Grandpa wasn't quite feeling himself lately, and we were going to take some time off from staying there. We were distraught by that news, of course. We only found out later that Grandpa had started to get dementia. As it got worse, he really started to lose it all upstairs mentally, and by the end, he didn't know anything that was going on around him. It was really sad. I understand as an adult... But as a child, seeing that horrible look in his eyes and listening to his erratic behavior was something that gave me nightmares for a long time. I used to go to Duncan almost every morning on my way to work. It was a routine for me to stop, go inside, pick up my coffee, and then head off. I'm honestly very lazy in the morning and don't feel like making my own coffee. Plus, it doesn't taste that good when I make it. I know I could save lots of money or whatever, but I just don't really care to be honest. There are Dunkins all over the place near where I live. I probably pass by three or four alone on my drive to work every day. There was one in particular I would always go to. It was just the most convenient with all the factors involved, such as parking, going in and out from the highway, etc. I just liked it the best. I got there one day and went inside to order. Usually it was pretty busy around this time in the morning, so after I ordered, I was standing there. I was near a couple of other people also waiting for their coffee, when at that time a random guy that was next to me started talking to me. He said he saw me there all the time. 
I simply said, yeah, I go here a lot. I didn't recognize the man, but it's not like I paid super close attention to the other customers around me. I was always tired and hadn't gotten my coffee yet. The guy started talking to me, asking me where I was from, where I worked, just stuff like that. I was talking to him as well, but he started to seem a little bit strange. Eventually, he asked me for my number. I didn't want to give it to him, so I declined. At about that same time, my coffee finished up. I grabbed it and then left. Now fast forward to the next day. I went again to get my coffee like usual. I ordered and was waiting in the same spot when the exact same guy came up and approached me. I was disappointed to see him in there again. He said it was a crazy coincidence to see me here. He then tried to ask me to hang out with him and tried to convince me to give him my number. I just kept saying no. He was being very insistent about it. The situation was frustrating. I really did not want to give this random guy my number. My coffee was done, so I grabbed it. The man sort of followed next to me as I went to leave. I turned and told him I was not going to come to this Duncan ever again. Then I walked out. As I left the building, the man did as well. I turned and told him not to follow me. He said that he wasn't. I walked to my car and luckily the man seemed to be telling the truth. As soon as I pulled back onto the road to drive away though, I saw a car pull out right behind me. I looked into my mirror and saw the same man was driving. I hope this didn't mean he was going to follow me wherever I went. Unfortunately, that's exactly what he did. After leaving Duncan and driving down one road, I merged onto the highway. Of course, he was still there. I even drove the entire rest of the way to my job, which took about 20 minutes, and he was still following me when I pulled into the property. I was worried, but I always parked in a secure area where you had to show your ID to even get inside. I was able to get through, and obviously the guy was not able to. He stayed in the parking lot area that was not restricted. I figured he would give up and leave after that. I felt a bit better. I went through the normal work day and left at about 5 o'clock. As I did, after leaving the parking lot and going back onto the road, a familiar car pulled out behind me. I realized it was that very same guy. I didn't know if he had waited there for me all day or if he came back knowing when I would get done with work. Either way, he was following me once again. I started driving home, but he followed wherever I went. Every single turn I made, he did so as well. Soon, I was getting close to where I lived. Instead of driving home, though, I turned back onto the highway. I wasn't exactly sure where I was going to go, but I certainly wasn't going to lead this guy right back to my house. I drove along the highway and took an exit, then drove down some more random roads. I just started driving around random areas in town for a while. Traffic was sort of bad. I was able to go into a sort of busy street and actually get a car or two in between us. I changed lanes many times and went through a yellow light as well. The cars behind me stopped, which trapped the guy at the light. I realized I got really lucky. I made it away from him and headed for home. I was able to make it back safely. After that happened, I obviously did not go back to that Dunkin' Donuts again, and consequently, I never saw that guy either. This story happened several years ago. During that time, I worked at a Dunkin' Donuts. I was part-time and got all kinds of different hours. We closed at 9 p.m., and on this particular night, I was working until closing. This is something I did all the time, and I didn't mind. Usually, the shop would be really quiet at night. Far more people wanted to get donuts and coffee in the morning. Still, sometimes it would surprise me, and we would be busy. That wasn't the case for this night in particular, though. 
I was working by myself, but that wasn't initially supposed to be the case. My co-worker just never showed up and didn't call in either. I was fine with working alone and knew that I could handle things. I figured it wouldn't be too busy anyway. When I started the shift, some customers came in here and there and ordered some stuff. The inside of our shop was a little larger than most Dunkin' Donuts. There were a few booths and many tables around. Sometimes people would come in and work on their laptops for a while or whatever. This night, after the initial hours, the place was pretty empty. For the last hour and a half, we didn't even get a single customer. When 9 o'clock rolled around, I started to close up. I walked around the lobby to make sure everything was in order. When I did so, though, I passed by a booth and saw a man on the floor. He was crouched down, hiding in a location that would be impossible to see from behind the counter. I saw him looking right at me. As I spotted him, his eyes snapped right to me. It was really awkward. I asked the man what was going on. He didn't move for a second, then got out of his cramped hiding place and stood up. He said everything was fine. The man was average height, thin, and had messy hair. I told him we were closed now, and he would have to go on his way. He said okay and took a couple steps toward the door. All of a sudden, though, he turned around and began running. It all happened so fast. He wasn't sprinting for the door, though. Instead, he went for the counter. He jumped behind and appeared to go after our cash register. After I realized what he was doing, I headed for the exit to leave. I wanted to just get the hell out of there and call the police. As I was running toward the door, the man suddenly shouted at me to stop right there. He said I wasn't allowed to leave and told me to stay and come over to him. By now, I was in the middle of the lobby, about 30 feet from the door and 40 feet from the man. I didn't move. I didn't know if this guy had some kind of weapon on him or something. I certainly didn't want to go over to him, though. I just ran for it. I gunned it for the exit. As I did, I heard him screaming at me to stop, and he started to chase after me. I kept going. I made it to the exit, threw open the door, and ran outside. I didn't think the guy would leave after me. I figured he was trying to rob us, and with me gone, why wouldn't he stay in there and grab up his loot? Then flee without any interference, but that wasn't the case. He kept chasing me, even after leaving the building. Now we were both outside. I was running through the parking lot. There were several other businesses very close by, but most of them appeared to be closed at this hour. I just wanted to go to the nearest open place and get inside. Tell everyone to call the police. If I was by other people, it would make me feel safer. After running out of the parking lot, the man kept chasing after me. I spotted a gas station up ahead that looked to be open. I was running as fast as I could, with the man right on my tail. I made it inside and yelled for everybody that could hear me to call the police right now. I only saw an employee behind the counter and one other customer inside. I ran into the back of the station and went to the bathroom. After I made it in, I locked the door and called the police myself as well. I waited in there for them to arrive. I didn't hear the man inside the gas station, nor any signs he had followed me any further. When the police got there, he was already long gone. We went back to the Duncan and I finished talking to the police, as well as handing over the surveillance video. They said they would look for the suspect, and I locked up the store and left. After that, I never heard anything more about it. I only worked at Dunkin' Donuts for another month. Luckily, I never interacted with or heard from that guy again. The events of this story take place 14 or 15 years ago. My daughter was still young and wanted to do everything with her mother. I was still young at that point too and had much more energies to do things that I don't do now. 
It's funny how certain memories and moments stick out to you as a mother. You cherish those particular moments and times, even as your young children grow older and start having families of their own. Anyway, my daughter had been invited to a birthday party of one of her elementary school friends. I don't remember their name, as my daughter never became really close with her, but it was a small school and almost every child was invited. I think the party took place at a Chuck E. Cheese. Maybe it could have been one of those off-brand places that kind of look like a Chuck E. Cheese, though. I remember it being a pretty uneventful day, mostly. The kids got food, tokens, and dessert, and were able to play in the ball pit and other play places. My daughter was usually pretty shy, so she hung out with me for some of the day. Eventually, though, she warmed up and started to play some of the games with the other kids, and ventured into the ball pit as well. I remember bringing a book to read while she was playing, and even though she wasn't with me, I always kept an eye on her to make sure she was okay. Even back then, you had to worry about strange people hanging around those places, or God forbid someone trying to lure a kid away and out the door with them. Shortly after the pizza was served, someone sat down next to me and said, Hey, how are you, stranger? I was a little startled and taken aback. I snapped my head back and saw it was Janice. You're probably asking, well, who's Janice? Well, she was one of my least favorite co-workers of all time, who also had just been recently fired. I hadn't seen her in a few months now. She was looking at me with these wide eyes, smiling from ear to ear. Her face was caked with makeup, and her hair looked like she had just left the salon. She was blinking rapidly, staring right into my eyes. When I realized I hadn't responded yet, I sort of said in an unenthusiastic voice, Hey, what's going on? She gave me this big creepy smile. Oh, I'm just here for the party. What about you? I replied it was much the same. Janice asked me which kid was mine, and I pointed her out. Oh wow, what a beauty. Just like her mother, huh? I still remember how weird those words were. I just nodded and went back to eating some food that was on my plate. Janice just kept going on and on. Well, hey, I don't want to keep you, but I have an amazing new job that's paying way more than before. I'd love to get you into one of the openings. Maybe we can talk about it over some coffee sometime. I was taken aback trying to get her to leave me alone. She grabbed a pen and paper from her purse and jotted down my number. I wish I'd given a fake one in hindsight. I told Janice I was going to check on my daughter and I would talk to her later. I didn't see Janice for the rest of the day. When the party was over, I knew my daughter would be exhausted and want to take a nap. We arrived back home and I sat down on the couch and started to dive into my book while my daughter was sleeping. I was just getting into it and felt myself starting to drift off a bit when next thing I knew I was jolted awake. It was the sound of the phone ringing. I was honestly so tired I didn't want to get off the couch to answer it. As I laid back down trying to see if I could fall back asleep, it continued to ring over and over. I got up and answered it, and was shocked to hear the voice coming from the other end. Hey stranger, what's with the Irish goodbye there? It was Janice, the co-worker. I could tell as soon as she spoke who it was, but I still asked who it was anyway. It's Janice, silly, calling to set up our coffee day and discuss that job opportunity. I tried to be as polite as possible and told her I was busy. Me and my husband had a lot going on. She went silent and just started saying, okay, okay, over and over again. I got off the phone quickly, assuming that would be the end of that. Over the next few days, though, I started noticing the phone ringing more and more. I would get up to answer it, but whoever was on the other end would hang up immediately, or I'd pick up and nobody would speak on the other end. My husband even started to take notice of it as well. He mentioned that when I was out getting groceries, they would still call. He answered the phone three times. 
One time, it sounded like someone was even breathing on the other end. I didn't really think too much about it. It faded away in my mind over the next few days. My daughter was at school, my husband was at work, and I was on PTO. I had just gotten done cleaning the entire house and folding up the laundry. That's when I heard a loud knocking at the door, like someone was attempting to beat it down. I walked over to the door to see if someone was trying to break in or break their hand against it. I peered out the blinds in the living room. I couldn't see who was actually at the door, but they were really pounding on it. I slowly opened it, with the chain lock still attached. Hey, there you are, sleepyhead. Peering through the crack, I could see it was Janice. I asked her what she was doing here and why she was trying to break my door. She let out this really weird laugh. I wanted to stop by and talk to you about that job. Half in shock, I responded, How do you even know where I live? She said, I had your number and your name. I was able to find out everything about you from good sources. I didn't know how to respond. I told her now wasn't a good time and to not show up unannounced again. I slammed the door shut. I heard her try to talk to me through it. Well, we'd been playing phone tag every time I called. I went to my window and just watched as she stood on the porch for 30 minutes with this weird look on her face, then sauntered over to her car and drove off. I told my husband about it, and he said to make sure that the doors were always locked and to let him know if anything else weird happened. Honestly, after that day, I didn't really notice anything. The phone line went back to normal, and there were no more unannounced visits. When I got back to work, I told a few co-workers the story. They stopped me and said, Do you know why Janice got fired in the first place? I didn't at the time, so they went on to tell me. She got caught stealing, and when confronted, she threatened to hurt people. Said some really awful stuff, too. I didn't say much after that. I went back to work, but all day my mind was racing about what she could have wanted by showing up at my house. Was she trying to steal from me? Did I do something at work to make her angry? Did she want to get back at me for some reason? After a week or two, it had left my mind almost completely, until my husband was watching some news. There was a report of a home invasion in a neighboring part of town. Guess who it was? Janice and her accomplice as well. They were both charged, and thankfully since that day, I've never heard her name or seen her. Every now and again, I wonder what would have happened if I'd let her into my home. A few years ago, I was chilling out at my apartment when I got a call from my friend. He was out at a bar drinking and called me telling me to take him to Burger King. He was silly and drunk, so I told him no and we hung up. He called back five minutes later. I answered, thinking he was going to ask me to take him to BK again, but this time he was screaming at the top of his lungs. He was yelling and sobbing. I frantically asked him what was wrong, almost thinking he was playing a joke on me. He was screaming that there was blood everywhere. He didn't know where he was and couldn't see anything. He said he didn't have any more teeth and thought he was dying. Obviously, I was freaking out. I asked him where he was, what happened. He said he couldn't tell me because his glasses had gotten destroyed and he couldn't see anything. I ran and got in my car and headed over to the area he'd last been at. I started driving around, trying to see if I could find him. I called my other friend that had been with him. What the hell had happened? She said they had just left the bar and he had gotten on his bike to go to his house. He had started to sober up even. It only took me a few minutes to find him. He was two or three blocks away from the bar, lying in the middle of a four-way stop. There was blood all over the ground, and his bike had been bent in half. I ran out of the car and put him into mine. I got his bike as well. His glasses had been completely crushed a few feet away from him. I rushed him to the hospital. He was in my back seat bleeding everywhere. I looked in my rear view and could see his jaw was completely detached from his skull. 
hanging off of his face. All his teeth were falling out in the back seat. He was trying to say something to me, but I couldn't understand a word. It was a terrifying image that still burned into my mind. Luckily, he was able to survive and is okay to this day, finishing up his PhD this May, in fact. He had to get his jaw wired shut and fake teeth, but he's alive at least. We don't know what happened that night exactly. His bike was in the middle of the intersection, but he was lying 10 feet away on the sidewalk. There was blood splattered all over too. We suspected someone did a hit and run while he was stopped at the stop sign. We tried to find security footage from businesses around the area the next day, but no one had their cameras pointed at that intersection. It still makes me super anxious whenever I think about it. I remember I had a really memorable experience several years ago. I was 18 at the time, and my little sister was 15. She went to a concert with some friends, and my parents told me I had to give her a ride home. The concert was in the city, and it was a little over 10 minutes away from where we lived. I'm not sure if it was Justin Bieber or Taylor Swift or whatnot. There was like a million people there though, so I drove down to the city and ended up getting really lucky to find a parking spot right on the side of the street. I parallel parked just a couple blocks away from the venue. It was some time at night. I think the concert was supposed to be ending shortly. I texted my sister and let her know where I was. In the meantime, the streets and sidewalks were really quiet. I was guessing it would become total chaos after the concert ended, so I hoped my sister would get out right away. As I sat there, I turned my headlights off and then went on my phone. About 10 minutes into this, I remember hearing footsteps outside my car. I figured it was some random person going about their business down the sidewalk, but I looked up and saw a man approaching from behind. He went right up to my window and knocked on it. I rolled it down a tiny bit and asked the man what he wanted. Honestly, I was afraid he might be a parking cop and was telling me I couldn't be here or something. Instead, the man asked me if I could get out and help him with something. I asked him what exactly he needed help with, but he didn't say. He just told me he would show me. This guy seemed obviously suspicious. I told him I couldn't help because I was waiting for my sister, and I had to pick her up soon. He kept asking me, and I told him no over and over again. At that point, the man actually started to walk away. He went toward the back of my car, and then went back up on the sidewalk. He didn't keep walking any further, though. He just stood on the sidewalk 20 feet away from me. I watched him take out a cigarette and start smoking. I kept waiting for my sister. Several minutes went by, and this guy was just standing there looking at me. It was making me pretty uncomfortable. I just knew he was going to try something again. Another couple minutes after this, I got a text from my sister saying she was leaving now. Around that same time, I saw the man in my mirrors approaching me again. The guy just walked up and tried to open my back door. Thankfully, all my doors were locked. He came over to my window and started pounding his fist against it. I didn't roll it down this time, obviously. I could hear the man yelling at me to open my door and let him in. I ignored him entirely. The man continued to try and get me to open my driver's door. Had he continued any further, he probably would have put some dents in my car. At that point, I put it in drive and pulled away. I went further down the street and went straight to the concert venue. It was a basketball arena. I called my sister and circled the stadium until she made it outside. I pulled over briefly when she was by me. She got in and I headed home. Unfortunately, because I was so close to the arena, traffic was really bad. We were in a standstill for a while. People were honking, we were barely moving. After sitting in traffic for 20 minutes, 
We made it a little ways and were almost out of downtown. At that time, I just happened to look up and see the same guy walking down a sidewalk nearby. Crazy thing is, right as I looked over at him, he snapped his eyes right to me, and our eyes locked for a moment. He started walking over to us. I couldn't go anywhere because of the traffic. The man walked off the sidewalk and right into the middle of the road. He walked right up to my window and started attacking it. I started honking and a bunch of other people started honking too. After 10 seconds of being harassed by the honks of cars around him, he finally gave up and walked away again. Within just 5 minutes, we made it back onto the highway and were now out of traffic. Luckily, we made it back home okay, and my car had no noticeable damage. Looking back, I don't know what that guy's problem with me was. It's so crazy how he saw me again and just went right out into traffic to attack my car. So, I move all the time because of my job. It sucks because I never have time to form real relationships, either intimate ones or even just friends. I'm friendly with everyone at work, of course, but I never make those personal connections there. I will admit that some of the blame lies on me. I've been asked to hang out before at other job locations, but I usually turn it down. I'd rather just go home. I guess I have no real reason to complain. I don't know if this is the wrong thing to say, but my brother always said I have old man syndrome, meaning that I always just want to work and go home alone. I hate to say it, but unfortunately he's not wrong. I can't remember exactly how many years ago this was. One day at the job, a co-worker I was not very fond of found out it was my birthday. All day long he was harassing me, begging me to go out for a drink or two and celebrate. That was the last thing I wanted to do, but at the same time, I really did want to get out more. I wanted to break out of the stupid shell I was always in. Throughout the day, he would constantly poke his head into my office. He just kept saying, It's tonight, bro! I would just nod and go along with it. At one point during the day... He told me a lot of people from work were going to be there to celebrate my birthday. Well, I couldn't exactly bail now. I hate to say it, but his stupid plan worked. I mean, what if all my co-workers came out to celebrate my birthday and I didn't even show up? Of course I would have to join them, especially since I was the man of the hour. We all worked until 9pm that night. A few nights a month, we would all have to stay until 9 o'clock to basically go over a bunch of documents. Around 7 o'clock, I found my co-worker and told him that I would join him at the bar after work, but we had to go right away and I wasn't going to stay out too late. He was really excited, kept telling me he'd get me home early and not to worry. A little after 9, I was walking to my car with my co-worker and asked him what bar we were going to. I was still new to the area, so I wasn't 100% sure where everything was located. I especially had a hard time finding my way around at night. After a little debate, my co-worker insisted on driving me, making some stupid argument like it was my birthday day. He just wanted me to have a good time. I was tired and didn't really feel like arguing with him. I'm also not much of a drinker, so I was worried I wouldn't be able to hold my alcohol. Probably for the best, I wouldn't be driving. Just in case, you know. While we were heading to the bar, we made some small talk. It dawned on me during that trip that I didn't really know this guy at all. He talked to me all the time at my job, but I never really talked back to him. This was the most intimate setting I had ever been in with him. I didn't really like it. He talked nearly the entire car ride without leaving any room for me to interject. We arrived at the bar and it was moderately full. I noticed right away that none of my co-workers were inside. I didn't say anything yet though. A few minutes passed by. My co-worker said everyone should be showing up soon and that I shouldn't worry at all. 
I wasn't worried truthfully. I didn't really care if they showed up. I just wanted to drink my beer, pretend to be a good customer, and go home. I thought that maybe outside of work this guy might be more tolerable, but he was even more unbearable outside. We'd been at the bar for about an hour, making some small talk. I noticed my coworker kept making eye contact with two guys at the bar. It was always very strange. He'd be laughing and joking around like always, then look over at one of the guys and frown, then nod and go back to laughing. I certainly thought it was strange. I just kind of blamed it on the atmosphere of the bar and drinking alcohol, though. Maybe with all the noise he was distracted or something. Happened to me all the time. After this happened multiple times, though, I couldn't help but feel like it was all intentional and not a coincidence whatsoever. I didn't say anything. It was around this time I kept asking to leave, but my co-worker insisted I stay just a little longer. He kept insisting that everybody would surely show up soon. I waited a little longer and finally told him I was going to leave. I said I was going to call a cab or something, since this was before Uber or any service like that. He really tried hard to get me to stay longer, but I'd had enough at this point. I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit upset nobody had even showed up when apparently they told my co-worker they would all come. When he realized I wasn't going to stay, he insisted on taking me home instead. I knew he hadn't drunk that much, but I wanted to be done with this dude for the night. He was a tough guy to say no to, though. Probably why he was such a great salesman. I caved in and just let him do it. I let him take me home. I told him where I lived and he responded by saying, Oh, I know exactly where that is. I'll have you back in no time, buddy. I sat quietly for a few minutes. Surprisingly, so did he. Maybe this guy did have an off switch. I noticed, though, that he was taking a really weird route to my house. I know I didn't know a lot about the area at the time, but I told him he needed to go the other way. He smiled and made some comment about me being new to the area, and he knew a special shortcut. I let it go and was done pleading with this guy. I felt like I had been doing it all night. We started to drive down a dark and desolate street. It was one of those deserted ones that had no life on it at all. The area was littered with old abandoned factories and businesses that had been shut down for a long time. Even most of the streetlights were broken. My coworker started telling me how this area was so spooky now and it was completely abandoned. As he was telling me some of the stories of the factories that used to be there, he started shouting out of nowhere and pulling over the car. When I asked what was going on, he told me he had a flat tire and he needed to get out and check it. It certainly didn't feel like a flat tire to me though. Every time I'd gotten a flat tire while driving, you could feel yourself being pulled in a certain direction. He got out of the car, and just as he made his way to the driver's side rear tire, another car pulled up behind us. Right as the car was pulling in, I started getting out too. I was startled. I hoped this car was just someone trying to help. The first thing I noticed, though, was my co-worker starting to back away suspiciously, like he was moving to the middle of the road. I also noticed the tire was not flat at all. It was at that moment two men got out of the vehicle behind us. It was the same two men from the bar that my co-worker kept making eye contact with. At that moment, I was speechless. I didn't say anything. Before I could even make a move, one of the men grabbed me and threw me onto the ground. He began to kick and punch me. The other man joined in as well while I was down. I tried screaming for a while, but eventually my voice stopped working. I could hear my coworker yelling for help, but he sounded far away. I lifted my head up from the ground and saw my coworker run back to his car. He drove off, leaving me there alone with these two men. The beatings continued for even longer. I felt like I was going to die. I could feel them taking my wallet and my watch. Eventually, they got in their car and left me there in the middle of the road. I was bloody, bruised, and everything hurt. 
I just laid there freezing. Believe it or not, an actual homeless man came over and helped me out. He walked me to a nearby gas station since I had no clue where I was. I was able to call the police and told them everything. I gave a description of the guys as well. The police asked if I thought my co-worker was involved. Honestly, it hadn't crossed my mind until that very moment. I don't think they ever caught the two guys, and my co-worker claimed he never had anything to do with the mugging. Ever since the police mentioned it to me, though, I didn't believe he's innocent. I haven't been able to believe that when he left me, he was just leaving to get help or something. When I reflect on everything from the entire night, it just seemed like everything was a little too set up. While I remained at that location for work, my co-worker remained his chipper self and always tried to get me to go out with him again. Believe me, I tried to never interact with him from then on. Whenever I would bring up the guts to call him out on it, he would always claim he had nothing to do with it and say he was so offended I would even say anything like that. I never received justice for that night, and it still bothers me to this day. Thankfully, I have stability in my life now, and a close group of friends I can celebrate my birthday with. I just hope I never have to experience anything traumatic like that ever again. A few years ago, I worked in the main office of a large grocery store chain in my region. I honestly hated this job, but it was a decent paying job out of college. My job was extremely boring and consisted of 99% computer work. At the time of this story, I had worked at the main office for nearly two years now and had yet to really make a connection with anyone. This may sound crazy to some people, but it was hard to make friends. The hours were horrible, the workload was a pain, most people just kept to themselves and did their work, then left for the night immediately. A girl I'll call Carla worked at the office as well. I was crushing on her pretty hard at the time. I'd never talked to her really though, other than the occasional, hey, how are ya, while passing in the hallway or whatever. One Friday afternoon, while my life was being drained at the computer, I got a message on my work email. It said it was from Carla. It seemed kind of random and seemed like a generic message, inviting me to her birthday party that weekend. I didn't care that it wasn't a personalized message. I was just excited to be invited at all. This was validation for me that Carla knew I actually existed. The email also contained an address and a time for the party. There was a little note at the end of the message that said to not talk about the party out loud. Not everyone in the office was invited. I was pretty thrilled that night. As I was leaving, I saw Carla walking down the hall, and we made eye contact. I smiled and said hello. She smiled back and didn't say anything at all. It didn't seem like a genuine smile, though. More a reaction than anything else. Just as she was almost out of sight, I said, I'll see you later then. She turned with a really confused look on her face. She waved at me as she turned the corner. That interaction gave me a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. We were at work after all, though, so maybe she just wanted to get home. It was a Friday, it's the weekend, maybe she just had an I'm leaving now attitude. And also, maybe she didn't want to give away she was having a party. When I got home, I got ready and put the directions into my GPS. I was surprised and a little annoyed that the directions said the party was 45 minutes away. Again though, I had a huge crush on this girl, so I would have driven two hours if I had to. I made sure I was dressed all nice and left so I could arrive fashionably late. The entire duration of the drive, I was planning out what I was going to say, running through dozens of scenarios in my head. As I approached the destination though, there were about 10 minutes left until I arrived. I noticed there was nothing in sight at all. No lights, no houses, no cars. Wherever Carla was having this party, 
It was smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I finally arrived at the address in the email. I was completely confused. There were no signs of life at all. The only thing here was a rundown farmhouse that looked like it had been abandoned for a hundred years. Not only that, there were also no cars other than mine there. Now, I want the record to show that I'm only half a moron. I knew this was wrong, and that getting out of the car was most likely a horrible idea. Thing is, I did so anyway. I thought to myself, well, I already drove all the way out here, might as well see what's going on with all of this. I knocked on the door several times. There was no answer, not even a sound of budging or shuffling on the other side. I tried looking in through the window, but it was obviously too dark to see. I started walking back to my car when I noticed a barn behind the back of this house. I couldn't see the barn from the road because the backyard where it was located was down a slight hill, not to mention it was pitch black outside. I was not going to investigate that barn. At first, I actually started walking toward my car so I could message Carla and tell her she had sent me the wrong address. As I was walking away though, I could hear a sound coming from said barn. I thought to myself, well, maybe they're out there and the cars are just parked somewhere else. I started walking towards it, hoping I would hear some talking or music or anything, something that would indicate a birthday was going on. There was nothing but an eerie silence. Just as I was about to enter the barn, my brain finally kicked in. I said, you know what, forget this. I turned around and jogged to my car. I was upset, but I didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing on some random person's property. This clearly was not Carla's party. As I opened the car door, I heard the sound of a heavy wooden door whip open. I turned around and saw someone running from the barn in my direction. They were running full speed, clearly making a mad dash directly for me. I jumped into my car and immediately started up and drove off as fast as I could. The person was so fast, they were actually able to make it to my vehicle and grab onto the side of it as I drove off. Eventually, they were forced to let go. I could hear a low voice shouting at me as I peeled off down the road. I was terrified, confused, and angry. All sorts of emotions were flooding through me. After that, I had no idea what just happened. I tried to email Carla, but I never got a response back from her. Eventually, I made it to Monday at work. I approached Carla and apologized for the whole birthday party incident. I told her I must have had the wrong address or something. She looked at me like I had nine heads. She said in a very confused voice, What are you talking about? My birthday was four months ago. Now I looked at her like she had nine heads. I told her about the suspicious email, and she confirmed it was not her. She showed me her email address, and it was a completely different one. In some ways, I was thankful this nightmare almost happened to me. It gave me the chance to finally interact with Carla. I was the most popular guy in the office for a couple days after that insane story. It wasn't until after that I realized just how horrifying this actually was. Someone was clearly after me, and me alone. This was my work email I got the invitation sent to. That means that someone in the office singled me out and dragged me out to that abandoned farm to do something to me. Something I don't even want to think about to this day. Thing is, I didn't have any enemies as far as I knew. I never found out who it was or why they singled me out. I never wronged a single person there, and nobody to my knowledge had any issues with me at all. Just a really crazy story. I still get freaked out every time I think about it. There was nothing quite like the classic sleepover birthday party when we were kids. Everyone getting together, playing games, staying up late, you name it. This party landed on a beautiful day. There were ten of us kids in total, and when we arrived, we all started playing basketball. We were planning on playing PlayStation 2 all night, 
so we decided to play outside earlier during the day. It wasn't raining, and it was beautiful weather, really. We had a one-on-one -on -one tournament and played for quite a long time. I don't know if kids still do this, but where we grew up, we pulled the hoop to the front of the house. We would have to get out of the road every time a car drove by, which thankfully wasn't that much. While we were playing this time, though, we noticed this beat-up gray car driving by several times. Ordinarily, we wouldn't notice something like that, but because of the condition of the car and how many times it drove by, it was very obvious. He didn't drive by every minute or anything. It was every few minutes. He wasn't just driving around the block before he would return and drive by again. By the fourth or fifth time of him passing us by, we were starting to get a bit annoyed. As he drove by the last time, he stopped at the end of the street. We all looked for a moment, but we soon started playing again. A few seconds later, he started to reverse. That's when we all got a little bit weirded out. He reversed until he was right underneath our basket and rolled down his window. It was some gross-looking guy. I remember he had really nasty skin and a bad comb-over haircut. He had this really squeaky voice, too. Hey there, little fellas. You guys look pretty good at basketball. I was actually on my way to the park to shoot some hoops, but I don't have a ball on me. Can I borrow yours? You know, some of you guys can come with me if you'd like to. What do you say? I knew this was bad news. I didn't want anything to do with it. I looked at my friend and said we needed to go inside now. I implied his mom was not going to be happy about us talking with a stranger. Most of us were quick to say no, realizing this was a situation we'd seen talked about a million times at school. A couple of the group were so naive they didn't realize this could be a dangerous situation though. I had to grab one of my buddies who was about to get into the passenger seat with the guy. We all started running back inside, even though the guy was still talking to us. The one thing I heard him say, and I remember it really freaking me out, was when he said, Oh, come on, guys. I won't even tell your parents. You won't get in trouble, I promise. Even at that young age, I knew what this was. I freaked out. We slammed the door shut, and I looked out the window. I saw the neighbor from across the street walk outside and approach the car, but the guy drove off before the neighbor could reach him. My friends were mostly unaffected by this weird interaction, but I had the worst pit in my stomach. Close to dusk, my friends wanted to play hide-and-seek outside. I voted against the idea. I didn't know if that sketchy guy would still be lurking around. Unfortunately, I was outvoted. We played for a bit, and I started to forget about that dude. I was hiding, trying to find a spot where nobody would find me. I thought I'd achieved just that, but I was about to find out how wrong I was. Behind my buddy's fence was a narrow walkway, between the back of his fence and the fence of the neighbor who lived behind him. All these houses had fences, so the walkway went almost the entire stretch of the street. I was hiding in that narrow path, thinking none of my friends would think to look behind the fences. While I was leaning against one of the wooden beams, I heard footsteps on the thick grass. Since nobody had mowed back there, the grass was pretty wild. I looked down the path and saw someone walking my direction. It was just dark enough outside that I couldn't tell for sure who it was, though. As they got closer, I began to clearly see who it was. It was the guy from the gray car from earlier. He was approaching me with this big smile on his face. In a voice just a bit louder than a whisper, he called out to me. Hey, bud. How about that basketball? You guys don't seem to be using it now. I kept telling him I didn't have one and started to move in the opposite direction. I could hear him breathing heavily and moving faster toward me. The more I moved away, the quicker he approached. If you're wondering why I wasn't screaming or yelling for help, the answer now was I guess because I was stupid. I was for sure scared. I knew this was a bad situation. For some reason, I remember being scared that if I yelled, it would make things worse. I don't know why that was my logic in the moment. I started to move faster down the narrow walkway. 
I heard him begin chasing me. I don't even know how close he was, but I could almost feel his breathing right on top of me. All of a sudden, I heard a loud voice yelling. Hey! Hey, you! What are you doing with that kid over there? I just kept running. I heard the guy chasing me say something under his breath, and then he jumped over one of the fences. I ran as fast as I could and shouted for all my friends to meet me back in front of the house. The neighbor emerged from the narrow path and knocked on the door of my friend's house. He talked to his mom for a little bit, and she made us stay inside for the rest of the night. I was happy, but my friends were a bit upset. Nothing more happened that night, and I never saw that guy or that car again. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized how scary and horrible this could have been. It sure was scary in the moment, but it didn't quite traumatize me. I just think as a child I didn't truly understand the severity of the situation. Parents out there, please watch your children. There truly are monsters hiding everywhere. The story I'm about to share took place about 15 years ago or so, when I was a teenager. I had a pretty close group of friends at that age, some that I went to school with, some that lived in my neighborhood as well. Most nights, we would be outside playing games, kickball, tag, hide-and-seek, a million other different things too. Most of us lived within walking distance of one another, the furthest was about three to four streets away. This close proximity made it easy to meet up often. None of us were old enough to drive. As we got older, our parents let us stay out later, and we would up the stakes of our games. We would allow a wider range of areas to hide in when we would play hide-and-seek, and change the rules to make the games more exciting. One night, my friend Patrick suggested we play flashlight tag in the cemetery. Patrick lived really close to a local cemetery. He was basically five to six houses from the main road, and the main road had a very large cemetery running parallel with it. Everyone seemed excited at the mention of this idea, but I was the exact opposite. Honestly, I was scared. I didn't want to do it. I obviously couldn't say that, though, or show that I was so scared. I agreed with everyone else. We decided we were going to head to the cemetery about 6.30 to 7 o'clock at night. The secondary gate would still be accessible. We could walk around and find a good spot to play before it got too dark. We all agreed with that. Everyone had to dress in all black though, and you could have two flashlights just in case one stopped working. It was up to you if you wanted to have it on or off. If you had it, you'd obviously be more likely to get caught, but you also wouldn't be as scared. I remember telling my mom I was heading to Patrick's house. She said, it's six o'clock, what time are you coming home? I told her I wasn't sure. She said that if it was after eight, I needed to call her, and she'd have my dad come pick me up. She didn't want me walking around that late at night. We arrived outside Patrick's house, and from what I remember, there were eight of us there. We made our way to the cemetery earlier than we expected, and started to walk around, find a good spot to play hide-and-seek. The cemetery was quite large, so we wanted to put some strict parameters on where we could hide. We found a decent-sized area close to the exit, and set the rules for engagement. We started to play even though it wasn't quite dark yet. Most of my anxiety had washed away, since we were playing before it was really dark out. I thought maybe we could get a few games in, then just get the hell out of here. Before I knew it though, we had only made it through one round and it was already dark. I was hoping that as we grouped up, we would just agree to leave, but of course that was not the case. My friends started grabbing their flashlights, and we asked if anyone wanted to volunteer to be the seeker first. Before anyone else could say anything, Joey, my friend, jumped up. He really was excited. We went over the rules again, and said that if you were caught in the light of the flashlight you were out, and had to meet up by the large tree we were all talking in front of, Joey was only going to count to 50, 
so people couldn't get too far away from the meeting area. He started counting and we all ran away, turning our flashlights out and finding a good place to hide. I didn't go very far. I found a large headstone next to a smaller tree and hid behind that. I was hoping that since I was a bit closer, I would get caught and be able to go back to the meeting area, where hopefully other people would gather together sooner rather than later. I could see Joey had his flashlight on and was walking in the opposite direction. I sat in silence. I could hear the wind blowing against the tree directly to my right. I thought I also heard something else. I jumped in surprise at a scream from another direction. Joey had found someone and they were heading back to the tree with their flashlight on. I figured I would take this opportunity to move slowly and get a bit closer to the main tree. I started moving with my flashlight off when I saw another person dressed in all black and hunched behind another headstone. From what I can remember, I would say they were about 50 feet in front of me. It was dark, so they could have easily been closer, though. I started making my way toward them, thinking we could hide together. But as I got closer, there was this terrible smell. It smelled acidic, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. I turned my flashlight on and saw that it was not one of my friends crouched there at all. It was an elderly man, dressed in all black with a hood covering his head. He looked directly into my flashlight. Would you be a good boy and help me for a moment? I froze for what felt like minutes, but was more realistically only a few seconds. I couldn't say anything. I tried to mutter out a few words but I came to the realization I needed to move right now. The man screeched out a blood-curdling yell. I started running and flailing my flashlight, shouting. I think I was trying to say it was game over or something. In all honesty, it was probably just a bunch of gibberish, though. I saw a bunch of flashlights turn on and move quickly in my direction. The old man was not only still screaming, but was following right behind me. Once the others saw what was happening, and that it wasn't one of us joking, there was a rush to the exit. It seems like it should have been a very memorable series of events, but the only thing that sticks out in my head is the screams of the man. Everyone was either too shocked or too scared to say anything. As we made it out of the cemetery, we continued to run towards Patrick's house. We got to the end of Patrick Street about five houses away from his, from where we were, we could still see the cemetery. The man hadn't followed us, luckily. It looked like he'd abruptly stopped at the cemetery's exit. He was now just standing there at the gate. He began to slowly walk backward into the darkness until we couldn't see him anymore. We went back to Patrick's house and stood in his backyard, trying to process exactly what just happened. To be honest, I don't remember much of that conversation. I think after a few minutes, everyone started heading home. Not long after, I called my dad to come pick me up. I remember not being able to sleep for a few nights after. I was scared that somehow the man would show up at my house, or one of my friend's houses. We stayed away from that cemetery, from that point on. Now, as an adult though, I wonder if it was someone just trying to scare us kids, or something with more malevolent intentions. Was it someone who needed some help? I guess I'll never have a way to know. My childhood friends and I were playing hide-and-go-seek at my cousin's house. All of the adults were having a dinner party, just a couple of houses down the street. We were all about 12 years old at the time. We were really living it up having the entire house to ourselves. We were playing hide-and-go-seek in the front yard at this point. My friend who was it went searching and saw two people in the middle of the street. He thought they were two of our group of friends and yelled at them, calling them names and trying to tease them. The two men yelled back with words of their own and they were not our friends at all. They were two random adults we'd never seen before. We all ran inside, grabbed a couple bats and turned the lights off. We hid in the bathroom together. 
At that point, we heard them running up to the house. We heard a gunshot ring out, and shortly after, the men began walking around inside. The bathroom was on the second floor, and honestly, we thought about jumping. We held on tight, though, and eventually, the men appeared to have left. A short time later, our parents showed up, asking what happened and what those noises were. It turns out the two guys had shot the front light out and kicked the door in. It was a really terrifying experience. I don't have a ton of great stories from my time in high school. I'm not ashamed to admit that I wasn't the best student, or even really the best human being. I've come a long way since that time. There's one story I remember like it was yesterday, but for all the wrong reasons. My friend's parents were out of town, and he invited a group of us over. He had a big house and a nice neighborhood, so any chance we got to go there, we would take it. A bunch of people were there and were doing some things that high school kids probably shouldn't be doing. One of the coolest things about this house was that his backyard was right up against the edge of an apple orchard. For a little backstory, when we were little kids we would go to the end of the row of trees and eat apples. We all felt like we were so cool. One day, the guy who owned the orchard caught us and yelled at us like we were trying to burn his house down. And yelled at us like we were trying to burn his house down. We didn't think it was that serious, but apparently this guy did. That was a long time ago, and every time I always came back to his house, I always brought that up. I reminded my friend how much I hated that guy. I don't know what exactly prompted this thought. But while I was staring out the living room window looking at those apple trees, I suggested we play a game of hide and seek in the apple orchard. It took a little convincing to get everyone on board, but everyone eventually loved the idea. I was down at first just to go along and play the game, but once I got outside in the orchard, I was reminded of how much I truly disliked that man. My friends and I were running down some of the rows of trees when I noticed the big barn in the background. All I wanted to do was break in and be a complete degenerate. I told my friend that I wanted to hide in the barn, and I convinced him that nobody would find us hiding in there. The door was locked, and my buddy wanted to give up. I didn't want to, though. I broke the lock and made my way into the barn. Once my buddy was in with me, I reminded him of how much we used to hate this dude. This was our chance to get our revenge. He was of course against the idea, but after a little convincing he came around. He was a good kid, but I was trying to get him to be a little rebellious teen for once in his life before we graduated. The barn wasn't your typical barn. This was an area where anyone who visited would ordinarily buy apples and seeds. There were all sorts of various goods in there. I don't know what came over me, but I started to trash around the place. It wasn't irreversible damage, but I knocked a few apples off the shelves and even took a few bottles of sauce they'd made. I remember being admittedly freaked out. Now I was technically breaking the law. I started to think about what would happen if I got in trouble. We were clearly trespassing, breaking and entering, destroying the guy's property. I couldn't get the image of being arrested out of my head. That's when I heard the door kick open. We looked over and saw the owner of the orchard standing there with a large rifle in his hand. We both hid behind a shelf and hoped he wouldn't see us. We could hear him walking slowly and yelling for us to come out. His voice sounded the same as it did all those years ago. If he had gotten that mad back then at a couple kids taking an apple or two, what was he going to do to us now for trashing his barn? He was standing right next to us, on the other side of the shelf. Each footstep felt like an earthquake. It was only a matter of time before he turned around and saw us. He fired a warning shot at the ceiling, which just about made both of us scream. 
we got up and sprinted out the back door we had broken into. The man yelled at us to stop, but we didn't look back. We kept running for our lives. We were bobbing and weaving through all the apple trees, hoping to lose the old man in the maze of trees. We were yelling to run to alert the rest of our friends we were being chased. Thankfully, they heard us, and everyone ran back to the house without being seen. When we got outside, we shut the lights off and looked out the window. We saw the man fire a shot at our house. The loud bang made us jump, and the flash of light from the shot illuminated the surrounding area. This guy was not playing games. He was going to punish us for trespassing. We were scared of getting caught and arrested at first, but the fear multiplied a hundred times when he started firing all these shots. Suddenly, the fear of being arrested didn't look so bad. Everyone fled the house, except for me and a few other guys. All night long, we stared out the window and watched the man patrol the tree line. He never put the gun down, not a single time. He didn't fire again, but he didn't need to. Those shots before were enough. I stayed up until dawn, and I kid you not, the man stayed outside the entire night. That morning, I left my friend's house and drove by the front of the apple orchard. There were two cop cars out there, and the owner was speaking to the officers. I did feel sick and remorseful for what I did, but I was too scared to go back and apologize. I never took responsibility. I outgrew that degenerate stage of my life, but I'll never forget the fear of being hunted by a man, who I guess in some ways was just defending his property. There was this old abandoned hospital on some private land, just outside the town I grew up in. It had closed down decades before, and the road leading to it was closed off by the owners. Very few people had entered the property since it had closed. It was something that the kids in school always talked about, though, as if it were a haunted building. When I was 15, my best friend and I decided we wanted to go and check it out. We had never been there before, but we always liked to explore the woods, especially in places we weren't supposed to be in. We always tried to find the hospital, and one day we happened to come across it. The building was huge, much bigger than I'd ever expected it to be. My best friend Tim and I were really excited, even more so that we weren't able to find any security keeping us away from the building. We got up to it and went searching for a way to get in. It wasn't too difficult. Many of the windows had long since been broken out. It was kind of weird being inside the building. When it closed down, it seemed they had left a lot of equipment and furniture in there. There was a lot of graffiti on the walls as well, which we figured came from other explorers just like us. What we found the most interesting, though, was the really morbid atmosphere of the building. It was so huge and so dark, it truly felt like an evil place. I mean, I don't really know how else to put it other than that. Tim and I didn't believe in ghosts, and so we weren't scared of that, but there was just this really unnerving feeling about the area. We gave it little mind, though, as we kept exploring the huge building. We were in a basement level, when Tim told me he was hearing something, I thought he was just trying to scare me at first, until I began to hear it too. It sounded like someone was moving around in one of the rooms. We figured it was an animal, so we thought we would go check it out. Tim opened the door to the room we were hearing the noises from. It was really dark in there, but we had a flashlight on us. Tim flashed it around the room, trying to see if he could find what had been making the mysterious noise. That's when the flashlight landed on a figure crouched down in the corner. When the light landed on the person, he fell forward until he was on all fours. He hid his face from our view. It was really creepy. He didn't move or do anything at first. Suddenly, the man began to speak. What did you do to my face? Why did you steal my face? He began crawling toward the two of us, 
faster than a man in his shape should have been capable of moving. Tim and I ran from the room and fled for the steps. We got up them and kept running until we were sure the man wouldn't follow us anymore. At that point, we decided we were content with what we had seen and decided to get the hell out of there. We had a scary story now, so that made the trip worth it. We later found out it was a crazy homeless person, not a mysterious ghost or anything. Why he talked about us stealing his face and tried to chase us, though, is something we speculated on for a long time. We never even got a good look at his face, so we wondered what it even looked like. Once, when I was a lot younger, I used to have to walk a lot of great distances. I didn't always have access to a vehicle, so I was stuck doing this many times. Every now and then, when the weather was really, really hot or it was pouring rain down, I would look out and someone would give me a ride. Those rides were few and far between, though. Still, when they would happen, it was really nice, and I was always so appreciative that I swore to myself, I would absolutely pay it forward whenever I did have a car myself. When I did start driving, opportunities didn't present themselves as often as I thought they would. I would see people walking, but it was usually in town, and if it wasn't in town, it was never in bad weather. For several years, I never really got the opportunity to be as helpful to someone as my rides had been to me. Honestly, I began to wonder if I was the only person I knew who ever had to walk around as much as I used to. It wasn't until late one night, when I was on the way home from a relative's house, that I had an encounter with someone that looked like they really needed a ride. My uncle lived way out in the hills in a cabin, and I had spent a lot of time over at his house that night. It was around one in the morning when I finally let him know I had to head home. There weren't many homes out on those hills. There were a lot of winding dirt roads all over the place, though. While I was driving, I turned a curve around a hill and noticed a figure just ahead of me on the road. I could immediately tell it was a woman walking on the side of the road. I had no idea why someone would be out walking on these roads this late at night. I decided I would offer her a ride. I pulled up right next to her and when I did she stopped walking and looked over at me. I rolled my window down and she bent over. I asked her if she needed a ride. She told me she could really use one right now. She lived pretty far away from this area, and if she had to walk all the way home, it would take her all night long. I told her I would be happy to give her a ride. That's when she reached into her jacket and suddenly pulled out a gun. She pointed it at me and ordered me to get into the passenger seat of the car, which I did immediately. She got in behind the steering wheel, gun still pointed at me. Once she was in, she ordered me to get out. I almost resisted, but she cocked the gun, and that was all it took for me to get out and shut the door. She drove off immediately. The first time I got a chance to finally pay it forward, it all blew up in my face. In addition to being devastated about that, I just had my car stolen on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. I was far from my uncle's house at the time, all alone in the dark with no choice but to keep walking down that dirt road. So, I began walking. This was not only going to take forever, but it was also very scary walking around out there. It was so dark. There was no moon at all that night. All the sounds of the woods, which I normally thought were comforting, were far less so on this night. I was much more aware of them. It almost seemed I could hear them clearer, I began to hear noises I normally would not have. I wondered if the woman who had stolen my car had accomplices out in the trees that might try to attack me afterward. I still had no choice but to keep moving and to see where I would end up. That's when the strangest thing happened. I had been walking for about 45 minutes in the dark. 
when I saw the red lights at the back of a vehicle up ahead. It wasn't a car that was moving though, it was just sitting alongside of the road. It seemed like it was still running. As I got up closer to it, I realized it was in fact my own car. I was immediately worried the woman would be there too. Perhaps she was waiting to ambush me and kill me this time. When I thought about it further though, she could have easily killed me before so that didn't make much sense. I cautiously approached the car, expecting something to happen at any time. There was no one around at all though. I kept looking around to see if she was hiding off in the trees or something, but I was unable to locate anyone. When I finally decided I was all alone with my car, I got in, rolled up the windows, and locked all the doors. The car was running but placed in park. I put the car into gear and started driving down the hill. This time, however, I had no plans to stop for anyone, regardless of if they needed a ride or not. Anyway, I got down off the hills and onto the main road without encountering any other people. I had no idea what happened. The whole thing was just so odd. There was no sign of the woman anywhere, and she hadn't taken anything from my vehicle either. She just abandoned it on the side of the road after only driving a short ways away. I asked my uncle later if he knew anyone who fit her description, but she was not familiar to him at all. Honestly, I thought he wouldn't believe me since it was such an incredible story, but he told me he'd heard of weirder things happening in the area before. I never found out what happened that night, really. Never encountered the woman again. I'm happy to say that I did pick up other people and give them rides, though, and no such thing ever happened. I wasn't going to let that one encounter spoil me from wanting to ever do a good deed again. Met a guy online once, back in 2002. He was part of a pagan website that I was also part of. I don't want you to think this story is anti-pagan or anything like that. It's just how I came across him. He also had an online journal slash diary that I would sometimes read as well. I don't think he ever knew that I actually checked that out though. After I invited him to come out from the Boston area to Chicago to visit me, he did a post about the trip on his online diary. I got the impression he was really looking forward to coming and seeing me. His name was Luke. I remember picking him up from the airport. I took a few days off from work and had the weekend off normally, so we had a fair bit of time to spend together. He told a lot of outlandish stories that I didn't truly believe, but I really liked him and I thought we were going to have a good time together. While he was sleeping a few days into the visit, I decided to check his online diary again. In it, he told a completely fictional tale of what had happened since he came to see me. He claimed he had found a secret room in my apartment and in it was a shrine I had built to him. He told his readers he was worried I was going to do something to hurt him. What worried me the most, though, was that he told them he felt he had to do something to hurt me first, before I got the chance to do anything. He said that he'd taken a knife out of my chopping block and stuffed it in his suitcase. He was going to wait to use it on me for when I fell asleep, and then he would leave. It was weird, eerie and unlike anything else he'd ever posted on that blog. I remembered the stories he had told me, the ones I hadn't really believed. I began to get somewhat worried. I was scared he really wanted to kill me for some reason. I thought about that comment about taking the knife from my chopping block, so I went to the kitchen. I was half expecting no knives to really be missing, but when I checked, I noticed that one was... I tried to be careful and quiet as possible as I checked inside his suitcase. My missing knife was right there. Now I was getting even more scared. I grabbed it out and put it back in the knife's block as quietly as possible. It took me a while for me to decide what to do. I grabbed his suitcase and carried it down to my car. I put it in the trunk and then woke Luke up. 
I told him there was an emergency that needed to be taken care of right now. I could either put him in a hotel for the rest of his stay, or get him an early ticket back home. Needless to say, he was a fair bit confused. I'd expected him to be, though. I let him know I had already packed his suitcase in my car. He asked if I could put him up in a motel close to the airport. I took him to the motel and went to park the car. He took his suitcase and went into the office, and I drove off right then and there and left him to fend for himself. I don't know what exactly he was planning. I bet he figured out that I knew when the knife wasn't in the suitcase anymore, because he never attempted to contact me again. I grew up in a very rural and large family. Many of my relatives, including myself, lived in some really country-style dwellings. In fact, I don't even remember living in a house that had a bathroom until I was 10 years old. My parents were divorced, and they rarely were able to find any work. A lot of our food was grown in the garden, or we'd get it from hunting. I didn't really know this at the time, but mental illness also seems to run in our family. Back then, people didn't talk about it so much, though. Also, when people were extremely mentally ill, we didn't think of them like that. For example, a sister of mine used to kneel down in front of the wall and talk as if someone were sitting behind it listening in on her. We never thought what she had was schizophrenia. My other sister and I simply thought there was really a ghost in the wall. As time went on, though, and many of our relatives were found to suffer from such similar things, we began to know more about these conditions. I have to bring that up, because I had a really scary experience when visiting the home of one of my aunts. Her son, my cousin, nowadays I would assume had schizophrenia, at the time, though, we didn't know about such things. He always had problems and was saying the spirits were after him. He would always tell us about the spirits and such that he had seen, and being young, that was extra terrifying for us. I've told some stories before. It was about visiting them and the dogs acting really weird, then seeing a bunch of glowing cows. But as weird as that story was, it was nothing like the one that happened this time. My cousin was acting even stranger than normal. He had gone from just telling us there were spirits he could see, to saying he actually believed the devil himself was after him. We were all raised pretty religiously, so this was not something we took lightly. There was nothing scarier to us than the possibility of the devil coming after us. My aunt was doing her best to try and make him not tell stories like that around us. We were too young in her view to hear such scary things. He would always whisper it to us, though, and every time we went to bed while we were visiting, we expected something bad to happen. We were staying at the house for about a week this time. My two sisters and I were sleeping in the living room as we normally did. We were all woken up by sudden screaming coming from my cousin's room. He kept on shouting, The devil has me! He's taking me to hell! Of course, this woke up everyone in the small house. It was quicker for us three girls to get to his room, though, than it was for his parents. I, being the oldest, opened his door and turned on the light, and what I saw I would never forget from then on. My cousin was chained to his bed. He was yelling and screaming about the devil in his room. He had chained him down and was ready to take him. I had never heard anyone screaming in such terror before or since. He was struggling against the chains, to no avail. He was in complete and utter distress. My aunt hurried us out of the room while she and her husband went inside. They closed the door and told us not to come in. All we could hear from the other side was him screaming and crying. Eventually, he stopped, and the parents simply told us to go to bed. They didn't speak to us about what happened, so we didn't know what went on after we were booted from the room. I can't explain why he had been chained to the bed. 
Part of me thinks he must have started having those attacks every night, and his parents had chained him to the bed to stop it. I don't really know. He never mentioned it. After that visit, we didn't spend the night over there ever again, so we have no idea what became of it in the end. So, this was about five years ago, and it still creeps me out. I was 18 at the time, and now I'm 23 years old. I was walking home from work at the local pizza joint and taking my usual route home. It was just about 9.45 or 10 o'clock or so. It was super dark as well. As I was getting about 100 yards away from the street I live on, a white van suddenly turned onto my street. It was nothing too suspicious yet, but something about it didn't sit right with me. I yanked out my earbuds and paused my music. I turned down my street, and as I was getting closer to my house, I started to get this really weird gut feeling. I look up from my phone as I was just about to text my roommate, who was out of town at the time. When I looked up, I noticed the white van was now sitting in front of my house, and the man inside was just staring at me. The yellow car light was shining on his face. He had brown hair, glasses, and thick facial hair. His van lights were off, but his car was running. I stopped and put my back against a tree in the neighbor's yard and just stood there, maintaining eye contact with this man. After what seemed like an eternity, he pulled away from my house and started driving toward the stop sign at the end of the road. I didn't put my back to him. I kept my back to the tree and maintained a visual on the van the entire time. He sat there at the stop sign for three minutes, all while I was not daring to look away. Finally, he turned right, the direction which I had initially come from, and after about 20 seconds of making sure he wasn't coming back, I bolted to my house. I got inside and locked the door. I went to the window and quietly peeked out through the blinds. After a few moments, I noticed him driving back up and down the street a few times, before he left once again. Afterward, I texted my roommate what happened. We went to each and every one of the windows in my house to make sure they were locked, along with the back door and garage door. I made sure to keep all the lights off for the remainder of the night. I didn't sleep a lick that night. I was so paranoid at every sound or movement. Let's just say I never walked home after that. There we were, two young teenagers standing in shelter on a boring Friday night, hiding out from the rain and enjoying an illicit beer. All of a sudden, four men appeared, who took exception to our presence for some reason. They just happened to be walking past and saw us there. Obviously looking for trouble, they came over and began asking for drugs. We started to laugh at them, considering the notion of smoking even cigarettes hadn't entered our heads in our entire lives. Never mind the notion of dealing hard drugs. The building had an entrance at both sides, so we thought it best to remove ourselves from this situation. We legged it up the stairs from where we were and ran across the top balcony. We planned to run down the other side and escape that way. Naturally, the four guys had split up Two went down the other side, where we then ran into them. One punched my friend on his way past them, but he escaped. I was unfortunately cornered by the men and started to receive a fearsome beating. Even in the days after, you could see the marks on my face where the laces from their boots whipped me while being kicked. They mocked my screams and kicked me from head to toe, repeatedly asking over and over why we were selling drugs. I refused to tell them my name as they tried to beat it out of me. These were dark times in Northern Ireland back then. There was a worry of them coming back for more or attacking my family. 
this refusal to give them information obviously made things much worse. At one point, I was told to stand up as they were going to send me over the side of the building. As you would expect, I laid there not moving, groaning in pain. If they were going to throw me over the edge, they would have to pick me up themselves, which is exactly what they began to do. Literally at that very second, though, one told the others to be quiet. The police had shown up. The man told me not to make a sound. They told me we would all walk down the stairs together quietly, around the building, and away. At first, I was behind them, but they obviously thought better of this, just in case I tried to push one down the stairs. They made me stand out front. Again, I was told not to make a sound. At this point, though, my instincts told me I needed to get the fuck away from these guys, or they were going to do something even worse to me. I booked it down the stairs and ran into a local shop a few yards away. That happened to be where the police were, much to my relief. The men were so calm as they walked away, right past that area. Karma would later strike a couple of them, who I found out died quite young. One in a motorcycle accident, and the other I can't quite remember what happened. The incident fucked me up for a long time. It was difficult for me to go out if I was unsure who would be around. I was well into my twenties before that nervousness left me. My mom put a criminal damages claim in, and I got a few quid for my troubles. And that rested in an account until I turned 18, at which point I promptly bought a motocross bike and discovered a love for racing. I suppose that's at least one good thing that came out of all of this. Even walking past that building, years after the attack happened, would bring back flashbacks of that night. Eventually, they demolished it altogether. It was not the first time a young man had been a victim of an attack like that at that estate. Just a couple of years beforehand, a 15-year-old had been thrown out through a window by a group of people and murdered. Luckily, I didn't face the same fate. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. And those were already a thing 20 plus years ago, but far less common, and initially only tied around the wrist. In my case, it was sort of a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of my family no matter what the situation. This is one of those stories that led to me earning my leash. It happened when I was about six years old. I went to the zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing, my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or I'd face the consequences. My mom was a strict parent that made good on her promises. She kinda had to be, being a single mother of three. I didn't intentionally disobey her per se, but oftentimes I just didn't pay attention to the world or people around me. No different this day, really. I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention, and off I was. When I finally realized I'd separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around searching everywhere for them. I was more afraid of what my mom's reaction would be more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just find a way out, find our car, and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So, that's what I tried to do. Well, I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood, looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar at all. I started sobbing. My mom was going to be so mad. That was when this guy came up to me, a totally normal-looking 40-year-old man, asking me if I was lost. I explained I'd lost my family while visiting the zoo, and I was looking for the way back. 
I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he'd just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance. They were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap, just like me. He was still a few blocks away, though. He proposed I walk with him to his car, and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his vehicle made me hesitate, though. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in the car with strangers. He said something like, Well, that's true, but you look smart enough to know if you could trust someone. I don't remember the exact words he said, though. He added that he'd spoken with my parents earlier when they were looking for me, so he was not a complete stranger. Well, even at that age, that didn't seem quite right to me. I asked him if he'd really talked to my dad, who had actually died just a year before. When he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the full extent of the situation. I was just really confused now, and scared of just how mad my mom was going to be after all this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of a security guard in a nearby parking building. He ran over and asked if there was something he could help with. The man stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation. He made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him at first, pointing us in the right direction toward the zoo. The man thanked the security guard and proceeded to take my hand to walk away. The security guard took one last look at me and asked me in a comforting, friendly adult-to-child kind of way why I was still crying. I told him that my dad was already dead. He looked confused for a few seconds, then asked if the man was not my dad. I told him again that my dad was dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changed. He turned to look at the man, who was now frantically trying to explain he'd never said he was my dad. The security guard must have just misunderstood him. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me off his hands now. The man immediately took off running. I don't think there was much else the security guard could have done, honestly. I explained the whole situation, and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which it turned out was just around the corner from the parking building he worked at. From there, we were brought to the security office, where my mom and sisters were already waiting for me. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place and right time that day. Just that extra second of time he took made all the difference in the end. I'd been running in these woods for as long as I can remember, but then something happened to make me change my mind entirely. And the story begins at around 6.30pm. I had just finished eating something and decided to go on a bit of a run. It was part of my usual routine. I always like to use the same path, cross the street, run for about a kilometer, and pass the gate that went through the woods. Something important to note is that the trail I used in the forest was separated about halfway through. One half of the path was paved, and the other was not. I would usually go into the unpaved path first, then turn onto the paved one after about three kilometers or so. Nothing had ever really gone wrong before this. I'd met some rare people walking their dogs, but other than that I was basically always alone. At least, I thought I was. I had been running for quite a while, when suddenly I got a notification on my phone. It was an airdrop notification. Since I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, I kept running for a couple of minutes, then stopped to change my music. I clicked open the airdrop. Who the hell could be sending me this? I was pretty sure I was all alone out there. At least, I hadn't seen anyone else. When I clicked on the airdrop, though, my heart immediately sank. It was a Snapchat picture of me running, with the caption, You look good. I didn't turn around. Instead, I kept running as if nothing happened, until I reached a certain point. 
You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised. I didn't like that rule when I was younger, so my friends and I had cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with the spot I remembered that hole being, I quickly turned and ran into the forest, aiming for that area. I could hear something rustling behind me, but I didn't dare to turn back. Once I reached that old hole, I tried to slip through it. Luckily, I was able to fit through still and absolutely booked it to the fire station that was a couple of streets down. The last thing I could hear when leaving the forest was angry huffing behind me and the sound of metal on metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted from me, but I never ran in that forest again. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.